Sarah. Welcome to Integrity Live. And we are live now with a new beginning. Hope you all like it. Uh, I'm with Andy from Modern Romance and many other things, as we will find out as we go along. Andy, how are you doing today? I'm all right, mate. Not too bad. Good Not to hear. You, know, you do realize, you do realize I did something which I very rarely do. I've set aside dinner time to do this because I was going to eat before I do this. And I thought, I don't want to rush dinner. So I'll leave dinner to the side, do this, and then go and eat. So if at any point you see me going white, falling off the chair, then you know what. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about this? Hang on. What's this I can hear? I know which one. So sadly you're going to pause it there because that's a great song. And I'm going to just go to big screen. I haven't gone live on my phone at the moment, but we'll see how that goes later on. But I'm sure other people are going to go live and see how it goes. Oh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Andy, or tell the viewers about yourself. Blimey, where do I start? Um, oh, suave, suave, debonair, good-looking, all nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I am the singer from Modern Romance. Originally, I, those who do know, many people are, are aware. Um, yeah, I, that's me up there. Yes, yes, hello, that's me somewhere. Yeah. Um, it's weird because I've got me here and I've got me on the screen up there, so I keep looking yeah. up and down anyway. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, that's when I started reformed the band and became the singer uh, yes. originally so i've been doing that for about 20 years now it actually fact, it was 20 years um yeah. um and originally i was the drummer uh joined the band just at the point where everybody salsa was about to be released um prior to my joining they'd had a couple of singles out that i didn't know about um that were flops um Yes, I joined them and off we went, touring the world, doing stuff. And um, I've been doing that the majority of my music life, actually. I mean, obviously, there were a few years beforehand where I was with other bands and yeah. I played in soul bands and jazz funk bands and all kinds of different things. Um, but then I joined this this shower and um, things just happened to take off. What did you join as? Was you join as a singer or was you a drummer or a guitarist? No, I joined as a drummer. Right. Um, and then sort of through a process of different things, and someone said one day, oh, you know, blimey, you can actually sing. And I went, oh, well, yeah, we try, you know, whatever. And they went, no, 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 you've got to do backing vocals. And I went, okay, then. So then it was down to the to the shops to buy Madonna-style, you know, headphone, headphone mic. Yeah. Because I'm drumming. I, I didn't want anything to start sticking over the drum, so you've got a headset mic. Started doing the um, the backing vocals, um, and I do I do remember actually it was quite and because I really admired the guy the guy who was singing at the time. We, we had two singers. We had the original singer who left after a year. He was a uh, not a very good singer, and then we got a proper singer, um, a guy called Mick Mullins. <clears throat> um, he was actually the backing vocalist. So when the first singer left, it was a natural progression for him to kind okay. of like. Yeah, just slot into that position. Yeah. And he was a fantastic singer, had a great voice. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for me, it was a bit of an honour to be asked to not only do backing vocals for him, but to be, like when we were doing stuff in the studio, they said, well, instead of Mick doing it and then doing the backing vocals uh, two or three times, you go in there with him and do them together and you can just do a couple of takes and that's it, that's four people because you two are doing it twice. Yeah. So to yeah. actually be in the studio with him and doing it, and I'm thinking of, Come singing next to this bloke, you know, he's a great singer. And I'm standing there singing with him. It's like, wow, you know, and I'll tell you how good he was. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when um, James Ingram came to London to do Top of the Pops and do Yum or Be There, which we all yeah. know, um, there's a bit in there that Michael McDonald sings. Remember Michael yeah. McDonald? Yeah, 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 Michael McDonald, yeah, right. There's a bit in there, um, and um, Michael McDonald couldn't make it. So they asked Mick to go and do Michael McDonald's a bit on top of the pops. Wow. Which he did, which Fabulous. speaks volumes for the guy, for his voice. Great voice. Um, so, yeah, anyway, so I um, started doing the BVs. Did that for a good three, three and a half years, um, you know, with Mick. Then the band did what all bands do, and eventually everyone went off their own ways. And, oh, yeah. and then when I reformed the band, um, it was a kind of... It was a very reluctant 
um, being pushed out into the front to be the singer because it, it, initially I got it together thinking I'd be playing a bit of percussion, excuse me, at the front of the stage, you know, playing a bit of percussion, doing a few backing vocals, uh, you know, doing a couple of songs, maybe, um, but have another lead singer. And everyone said, no, 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 you've got to be the singer. You're the original member. You've got to be the singer. You can't just do, you know, a bit of percussion and just, you know, natural sort of thing. And uh, eventually I went, well, all right then, I suppose, you know. I mean, I really, I really didn't want to do it because, mm. um, all right, now, now it's a piece of cake, you know, I'm used to it. But yeah. initially, um, being told to, and, and any musician <laughs> will tell you that this is the case. Most, most musicians, most musicians who play an instrument and um, do some backing vocals, if you say, right, now take the microphone, no no instrument, just stand outside there and sing. It's like being, it's like someone asking you to sing without your clothes on. Yeah, That's yeah. What it feels. yeah. yeah. Um, and it's terrifying, to be honest, to, initially it was for me. Mm. Um, I remember shaking so badly at the first gig. You know, actually, my hands were literally like this. Um, in actual fact, I'll use this bottle here as a right. My hands are shaking so to uh, sorry, just in case, in case people wonder what this is. It's a little bottle that I'll put some lights in and nice anyway. But um, my hand was shaking so badly that when I was holding the microphone, it was like, like this, and you could see it moving. And I thought, I've got to do something about it. So I had to grab the mic with both hands and try and steady it. Uh, thinking, okay. well, you know, people are going to think, look, he's so passionate, he's holding the mic with two hands, yeah. he's really giving it no. I'm trying to stop the mic from bloody shaking because people are going to yeah. see it. It'd be so yeah. obvious, you know. Um, obviously, after over a period of time, that kind of that fear dissipated, and I was able to sort of go on a, as like a normal person and sing. But it yeah. took a while. It did take a while, I must admit. Well, I think didn't Rod Stewart when he was with uh, Jeff Beckgrave his first first gig, he stood behind the amps and he wouldn't come out and sing because he was so nervous. Well, listen, people still there are still many many stars many stars big huge stars who get nervous who mm. throw up before they go on stage yeah. do all kinds of things you know have to take a million things and yeah. you know be calmed down in a million different ways and they've got everyone's got their um little superstitious things they do you know walk around in a circle three times you know spit in the corner god knows yeah. all kind of weird things no, fortunately, I've heard all that. Yeah. fortunately i don't have anything any of those i just make so long as the goat's backstage with me i'm fine Absolutely. Right, I've got my goat. That's fine. Um, yes. No, no superstitions. Um, but no, I've got nothing like that, fortunately. And I've gotten over the fear to you know. Uh, now yeah. it's just uh, an apprehensive kind of excitement more than anything else. But um, yeah, no people get ill, and you know, as I said, they you know they can throw up and all kinds of yeah, weird. Yeah, stuff. I've heard yeah. the stories. Yeah, you know, from, from Delve Stray and other people. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you a quick question now. One thing I'm a bit annoyed about this is you came to my house way before lockdown, and I never got you to sign this, so you're going to have to sign this sometime for me. Right. right. But Let me tell you a story about that album. Go on in. That album is not an official release. Isn't it? Right. Now, what happened was right. we signed, I signed to somebody who was going to put the album out. In actual fact, if you listen to some of the tracks, it's clipped the beginning off. The very first bars are slightly clipped. It was just nonsense, right? Okay. I was. We were supposed to put this album out, and um, in the end, I said to him, look, you're not doing your job properly. Um, our contract's not avoid, avoid. You're in breach of your contract. That's it. We're not putting it out. Who was that, it? That, that was the end of that. Well, let's not name him here, because I don't really want to give him credit either. No, no. Go on, Mitch. But anyway... Well, we on. The reason why I showed you that because I understand is there a new best of or greatest hits coming out with well, this, is, this is the thing. This is the thing. Okay. That album was never right. officially released. Gotcha. Um, and the version of Walking in the Rain on there is done by a girl, by a friend of mine, Tracy Graham. She sings with ABC. Okay. Um, yeah. She did it as a kind of let's see what it's like. And anyway, that album all of a sudden, without me knowing, got released to a, through a company called Delta Records, who have now gone bust anyway. Um, but that for years they were around and they were putting this out. Mm. And I phoned them up and said, look, you know, mm. I haven't sanctioned this. You can't put this out there. Well, he said, we've did the deal with this person. We've not done anything wrong, which they haven't. Because what happened was is I signed the deal with him and then said, you're in breach of contract. And I wrote him a cease and desist and said, that's it. Forget it. I'm not doing any promotion for it. I'm not doing anything. This album, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't exist. Um, 
he still went ahead and put it out without my knowledge. Mm. So that's when I found that Delta were doing it. They said, well, we've done nothing wrong. We've signed a deal with this guy. This is, this is the, the sad thing about the music industry. We seem to attract far more sharks and con men in this yeah. industry than any other, probably because the money to be made yeah. is so much greater than anywhere else. I'd say the only other arena that you can get um, more money than in the music is maybe the sports sports industry. Yeah, but they've got they've you can't as a sporting person just walk up and sign stuff because when you first sign to a club or do anything, they've got your interest at heart and they look after you. Whereas we don't have that. Yeah, we don't have that. Mm. So, um, so anyway, so he put this album out, and when I spoke to Delta, they said, "Yeah, well, we've got." 2,000 of them sitting here in the office. If you want to buy them off us, then we'll take them off the shelves. And I thought, you want me to buy 2,000 copies of my own album Jeez. that I'm not even going to get any money out of? Because, oh, no. right, he did as well. He sold the, he sold the rights to, to Delta. And if you imagine, for example, I'd signed to John Bunyan Records Limited. Mm -hmm. He actually put them out through John Bunyan Music Limited. I understand. And yeah. John Bunyan Records Limited. So there was no recourse for me. I couldn't go back no. and say, where's the money? Because it folded and he disappeared. But John Bunyan Music was going and he was getting royalties for John Bunyan Music. So that album has sold quite a few copies, I must say. Uh, I actually found, and I actually know it's been sold abroad as well. Um, got no money for it. But having said that, what I did is I've got that album, repackaged it included six new tracks and that's the official album that we're putting out um in whatever it is uh, november the 19th is the official oh, this year. excellent yeah. i was to be honest i wasn't going to do it no but this year i was actually initially going to release it last year so what happened i mean last year was an eventful year god i don't even know where to begin right last, basically <laughs> last year was the end of a two-year battle for the name Modern Romance. Um, well, I've been doing it for almost 20 years. The guy that was in the band, the singer from 2000 years BC, the first one I mentioned earlier, yeah. suddenly decided, oh, well, Andy's doing really well. He's been doing it for 20 years and he's really doing well. I want it. Well, no, you can't because the law says you left 20 years ago. Well, no, sorry, you left 40 years ago. The band went on and had much, much bigger hits without you because we got we became a better band because we could do better material. So yeah. when you have we did better songs, we had more hits. It's it's you know, chronicled in the in the books. It's not like I'm making it up. You can see we had bigger and better hits um all over the world. So he suddenly decided, well, I want a piece of this action. Well, sorry, yeah. but you can't have it, it's mine, you know. So what he did is he went and registered it very craftily, very surreptitiously with the intellectual property office. No, no end of problems. The gig started being cancelled. People saying, we're worried about touching you because he's threatening to sue us. I said, but he's, he, he registered it two months ago. I've had it for 20 years. Anyway, although I won in the end. So having won, I decided I'm going to go to Cyprus for a nice, long, well-earned break. So I decided to go for a seven-week holiday, which is unheard of, I know. But I've got family there, and I thought, I'll go there, get my motorbike, I've got a motorbike there, get my motorbike, off I go. Was there for two weeks, and, th and I thought, I'll come back, and then we'll do the promotion for the album and release it last year, as, as intended. So I was there for two weeks, and was travelling from, what was going from? I was going from... Lana Clertonitia to see if to say with a friend of mine stay at his house for a few days because I had a flat in Lana that I, uh, I was renting and um I thought yeah I'll go and see my mate Andrea and stay with him for a few days he was expecting me but as I got close to Lana I thought well it's uh, to Nicosia sorry I thought you know they've got these flyovers and roads and stuff you know they've actually got one road with you know asphalt on it and I thought they're getting they're getting you know really clever Andy I need to know where I'm going I'm joking. And they've got a few roads like that. But this particular bit has got roundabouts and bits going off it. And I thought, I really don't want to be like looking for it. I'll pull over and put sat nav on. Yeah. On so I'm sitting there putting sat I was sitting there for about 40 seconds putting sat nav on. And a lorry came along at 75 miles an hour. And I did obviously I didn't see it because it came from behind me. Bang. Gee. And the next thing I knew, I'm standing there. 
um, the bike's on the floor. I mean, I don't know how this happened. I don't know how, even, even the ambulance man said, why are you not dead? I don't yeah. know. It, I was, was obviously, was I was meant to do this show, that's why. Anyway, so. Um, Sounds good. So anyway, so the next thing I know, I'm, I'm, I'm standing, whereas I was sitting on the bike with both legs up and the stand mm -hmm. on the floor. So both legs are in, fortunately, that's what saved me. Next thing you know, the bike's on the floor. I'm standing next to the bike. I don't know how this happened. Um, and I thought, what on earth was that strange feeling? You know, oh, for what, what does my leg hurt? And I looked down and the muscle was hanging out of my leg. And I looked at it and I thought, I don't know how the hell I was so cool about it, thinking about it now. I thought I should have been panicking. I kind of mm. looked at it and thought, ow, that really hurts. And I thought, you're in trouble now, mate. You need to do something about this. And the blood was like everywhere. And I thought, oh, right, okay. Meanwhile, matey boy, not so much for Cypriot hospitality that I'm very proud of. Matey boy, who is a Cypriot, he's just going off down the street. He's got no intention of stopping. Stopping, no. And See? I thought, this is not looking good, you know. Um, I looked down at it and I thought, mate, you you really need to do something about this. So um, the only thing I could think of was to lie down and stop the flow of blood because it was just yeah. everywhere. So I thought, I'm going to take the weight off it and lie down. Meanwhile, there's no one else on the street because it's quarter to five in the afternoon, late afternoon. It's 30-something degrees. No one wants to be out in that. So everyone's mm. at home in their air conditioning, chilling out, mm. just waking up from their little siestas. So, you know, me, I'm on my Todd out there. He's just whacked me. He's going. And I thought, right. So I'm lying, actually lying on the floor, looking at him going down the street, thinking, because it's a motorway, so I can see him for ages. He's going. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, you're just going to leave me here, mate. I thought, that's not good, really. Um, so eventually people stopped and came to help. And... Um, took me off to the hospital. Um, and this is the funny thing about it. Um, as soon as I got there, I got wheeled in. So, you know, leg hanging open, everything, not a pretty sight. I thought, so I'll take a picture of it. And then I thought, do I really want to see that again? Not really, so I thought, no, I won't bother. <laughs> I decided not to bother. Um, so as soon as I got wheeled in, the, the guy who's going to look at me said, right, wheel him in, let's bring him in, let's have a look. You know, and he's on his phone and he went, oh, bloody hell. I went, oh, and he went, You've only just got it, guys. It's already on the news. But you've been hit by it. And I thought, this wow. is not good. Yeah, I thought, this is not good. Because well, my kids are going to might see this. Because oh, obviously, yeah. their grandparents have got Greek TV here in the UK. So I thought, I need to phone them and tell them that I'm all right. Because they're going to see you know, a guy from Monroe mm -hmm. hit on a, on a bike. And that's it. If that's all they get, they're going to imagine the worst, right? So I rang them up to tell them. But then the police arrived shortly after and said, right, um, we... Oh, I, I forgot to mention. So I'm lying on the floor waiting for the ambulance to arrive, which they eventually did. But at one point, the guy got so far down the end, so far in the distance, he was a spot. He was right. a little speck on the horizon. And then I thought, why is he not getting any smaller? Oh, he stopped. I thought, that's very bizarre. Why has he stopped? You know, maybe he feels bad. I don't know. Anyway, so he stopped. Never came, I mean, it was a long way away, I must admit. But I still, he never got out of his cab to come and see me and see how I'm doing. So I thought, anyway, so by then, the police arrived. I'm sitting there lying down thinking I'm not moving, you know. I just I just remember, it's really, but I just thought, I want to go to sleep and wake up and then this is a dream. This is not really happening. Maybe it was the shock of it, or I don't know. But I just thought, I just want to yeah. sleep. Just leave me alone, I'm going to sleep. I thought, I'm just going to lie here, do nothing, you know. Anyway, they arrived, took me to hospital. And, um, and then the police came and said, right, we've just had a chat with him, because obviously he stopped up the road, um, just had a preliminary questioning with him, uh, and then um, apparently it's your fault. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I was not only stationary, the engine was off, because when you put, I don't know if you know, if you hit that bike, so when you put the stand, side stand down, yeah. cuts the engine. Yeah. I did that because I wanted to not have to worry about balancing the bike and looking on Saturday night before. Put the stand down, and that's what saved me. Putting the stand down meant I could have both my feet up on the pegs. Yeah. Which they weren't sticking out. Otherwise, imagine, if he's done that to me, imagine if my leg was out there. He'd have dragged Absolutely. me out. That's what he said to me. The, the guys did say, the hospital guy said, you're about three inches from being dead. And I thought, if my yeah. leg was out there, that was the three inches. Yeah. So anyway. Um, 
So he said to me, yeah, we had a chat to him and apparently it's your fault. And I'm like, <laughs> how did he work that one out? Well, apparently you turned in front of him. And I said, look, hang on a minute, it's the motorway. Can't go anywhere. Yeah. I'm not going to turn right and go into the central reservation, am I? So, right, they said, no, don't worry, we're going to go and look at the scene anyway. But we're just letting you know that if that's his initial thing. It's your fault you turned in front of him. I went, oh, okay then. So um, a couple of days later, they, you're going to love this. A couple of days later, they came to see me. They phoned me up and said, can we come and see you and take your statement? I'm in hospital now, you know, lying, looking up at the skies, thinking, is this what I came here to do for seven weeks? Not really. <laughs> but anyway, um, grateful that I'm still here sort of thing. I thought, oh, okay, you know, it is what it is. Um, so they came to see me and they said, right, um, we should let you know before we begin that he's changed his story. And I went, okay, now what? Well, apparently he said he was, he said he's unaware that he hit anyone. He didn't even know that he hit you. And I said, well, if that's the case, when you first questioned him, what was yeah. his first thing to say? Was well, his fault he turned in front of me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They said, well, look, don't worry about that. He said, we've been back to the, um, I was quite surprised actually, because I mm. generally, although I'm super and very proud of it, I have a, a quite, like many secrets in London, we have sometimes a bit of a low opinion of how they do things in Cyprus because they're a little bit like Jamaica. We'll do it tomorrow, later, mate. But yeah. Yeah, tomorrow, yeah, it's fine, yeah. So I thought, what have they done? You know, what have they... anyway, he said, well, we, we check it all properly because we measured it all with lasers. So they measure it, the distance of him mm. stopping and where the, the point of impact with the laser. It goes, we can tell you that he stopped you know, 1,000 whatever yards away. They knew exactly to the full, wow. right? They said, that's where he stopped. That's where he hit you, right? And they said, um, we know that he hit you in the hard shoulder because he said it's so apparent because all the, he said the bike ended up on the hard shoulder. All the debris from the bike is in the hard shoulder, not in the street, all in the hard shoulder. Your iPod, your phone, all your credit cards strewn around that came out of the wallet, all in the hard shoulder. So we know he hit you there. And he said, more importantly, he said, your blood is only in the hard shoulder. Yeah. So I thought, okay, that's fair, fair comment. He said, so we know he hit you there, so we know it's his fault. He said, but the most bizarre thing is, he said, um, do you know why he stopped so far away? And I said, well, I don't know. So the, to, to me, initially, it looked like he was foot down and I'm going. Yeah. Leave him there. He goes, well, yeah, that was his intention, he said. But the only reason he stopped is when he hit you at the point of impact, he got a flat foot tire. Oh, that was as far as he could get before he had to pull up. Yeah. Oh. Well, when you talk, I wonder why why he stopped up there. Oh. Yeah, that's why he stopped because he didn't have, he didn't have any intention of stopping. That's no. what I mean. Is this the Greek hospitality that we're very proud of? You hit stuff <laughs> and carry on going. So anyway, um, so he was char he's being charged and it's all going through city cities and stuff at the moment because he's been charged. That's the end of story. It's just mm. a question of finding out what's what. But um, so that in itself stopped me from releasing the album, going back yeah. to the album, because yeah. obviously when I came back, I couldn't do, um, well, I was there for seven weeks. I ended up staying nine mm. from the two week holiday that I'd had so far. Then we had a five week hospital and, and a five week hospital and home recuperation at my, at my friend's house, the one I was trying to visit. So, after that, they said, well, you're better, but you can't fly to the UK. Because when you looked at my legs, if you look straight down, if I took a picture and said, there you go, they go, well, obviously it's you and a mate, you put your leg together and try yeah. and make a pair, you know. It looked like someone else's leg, totally. Different size. Um, so they said, you can't fly because your legs are too swollen and we just don't advise it. So I had to then buy another ticket for another flight and come two weeks later, which wasn't that bad, I suppose, because it allowed me they said to me, you can go in the sea. So obviously I had a, a wound that was stitched up. Yeah. But, you know, salt water is always good for it. So they said to me, go in the sea as much as you can. So I'd hobble into the sea and hobble out again. It's ridiculous. But anyway, having done all that, I came back to the UK and um, I wasn't in the frame of mind to be promoting an album. Yeah. You know, I consider myself fortunate to be here, but I, the album just went completely out of my head, to be honest. Mm. Um, I was just lucky I was alive and I thought I want to see my kids and just get all my stuff. Um, so I, to be. I, yeah, so I, I forgot all about it um, mm. until very, very recently. I'll tell you how recent. 
two weeks ago. I was wow. talking to the guy from the label and he said, look, he said, it's been such a crappy year for people. Yeah. Um, he said, uh, why don't you release it now? He said, because people will probably like to have lighthearted, dancey, fun music you know, and have a good time. And he said, you've got all the hits on there. You've got, you know, six songs that people, you know, the general public won't have heard, um, f- five of which are, again, dancey kind of you know up tempo numbers um and i didn't take it didn't take much convincing to be honest because as I, no. I, I thought about it and i thought you know what it makes sense why not you know it's, it's been it's been a grim year for everyone absolutely you know, lots of people have lost loved ones you know i've got two friends um who both came very very close to death um so and that's just two that I know. I mean, what about all the people that I don't know that have died and yeah, yeah. we've had a rubbish year just generally, you know, financially, personally, you know. So, um, and I thought, do you know what? Why not? You know, if it, if it gives, it, uh, listen, I want to release it. Of course I want to release it. I want to release it and, uh, you know, and get it out there as much as I can. That was the initial thing. You know, that's what we do, musicians. But I thought, if it can bring more pleasure to people now by brightening up their Christmas or whatever, and people go, do you know what? Yeah, let's play this stuff and dance around the room like lunatics. Um, I, agree. I agree. Yeah, and it's 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 not ironic. It's not the right word. It's I suppose to a degree it could be ironic. It's just sad that one of the songs is best years of our life, and this year yeah. has probably been and the worst did. year of yeah. most people's lives. Yeah. But then you know what you know it's just the title of a song the sentiment is there for us to go and have a good time and for everyone to dance and run around like loonies you know i'm looking forward to going back on stage and singing it and getting a crowd of twenty thousand people singing it back to me because that hasn't happened the whole of 2020. no and there were so many gigs planned and they've all been you know not just mine but everyone's gigs have just been like that's it forget about that it's we're not having it it's not happening this year so you know, if I can get the album out and get people singing and dancing to it and remembering what a good time they had in 2019 and what a good time hopefully they're going to have 2021, yep. then what the hell, let's just get it out there and just have some fun. Absolutely. I like the idea because music always gets you through nearly any problem. And it's always good to have great music. Uh, there's a lot of people releasing stuff now. I think they've, they've realised we do need to get music back out there because the entertainment business has been hit hardest of all. Because you think footballers are still playing football now. They've gone back to playing football. Most of the sports, tennis has gone back, rugby's going back. But the music industry and the entertainment industry, films, is suffering badly. Yeah, films, theatre. I know. Yeah. The thing is, the difference is with football, because of the vast sums of – we were talking about this earlier. There's yeah. stupid amounts of money in football, right? I mean, if I, listen, if I was a footballer and someone said to me, I'm going to pay you 200 grand a week, I'm not going to say, well, no, no, that's important money. I, I only want – a thousand of course yeah. i'm going to talk to you, right so i don't blame yeah. you, right? i agree but because of the vast amounts of money involved in football and the money they get that's generated from tv rights whatever they can they can still have a game and televise it and it's still it's still they going from the television yeah, yeah. The, the priest can still operate. yeah but we don't have that luxury in music because not for cool. us you know, you, a, a promoter is not going to say to you, well, look, come and play it in the field. You would have had 20,000, 22,000, but we're only going to have three and they've got to socially distance or 2,000. I don't, I don't know. How many people can you get in the field and be socially distanced? I don't know. But, yeah. you know, it could be anything, 500, 600, 1,000. But financially, it's not going to work for them. They're going to – why would you do that if you know you're going to do a gig, you're going to pay the bands everything you have to pay them, and it's going to actually cost you 800 grand. Yeah. To do that because the setup fees for these things are huge. You know, you've got mm. security, this, that, the other, the, you know, the stage, everything. That doesn't change just because you've got COVID. They, they, they're not going to say, yeah, well, yeah. we were going to charge you, you know, five grand for a PA system, but we'll we let you have it for 500 quid because it's COVID. No, they still got to do their thing. So, yeah. Exactly. So it doesn't it doesn't benefit the promoters and the you know the agents mm. or whatever. So yes, we are suffering. We were the first to be told you can't you know you can't do any work because your 
you're encouraging people to to, yeah, to yeah. get together in big masses mm. and we're obviously going to be the last to get back to work because until it's under control and you know everyone's sorted out you know we've got some kind of measures in place where we know we're all safe they're not going to allow twenty thousand people to gather you know Certainly not, no, no. Yeah. so again, again although they're not allowing fifty thousand to gather at, or sixty thousand to gather at football matches they can still have the football matches and televise them and get their money from the TV rights and everything. As I said, we don't have that. We don't no. have that luxury, so we're suffering. Yeah, and the other thing, Andy, as well, which we spoke about earlier, most artists like yourself, like my mate Del from Stray, etc., when you're on stage, you want to get the repartee back from the audience. So without an audience there, even with a small audience, it's not the same. And people are saying, well, why can't you do it like – in your own room and then have it shot out to people over like the internet like zoom and all that you haven't got the comeback from people and it, you miss all that I think yeah. we've done that i've done that a few times um I did, I did it with let's rock i did it with a few other people a few other i did some charity stuff one guy he wanted to raise i think he wanted to raise a thousand pounds and then he said so i'm, I'm doing this gig i'm trying to raise a thousand pounds for a charity and i said yeah of course i'll do it and um i did a few songs with um backing singer from modern romance who we'll talk about later uh, with natalie and um I like to, yeah. then he says oh we're on 20 grand and counting he only wanted to raise a thousand and i thought i felt great i thought well i i helped you raise 20 grand and you're still i mean he was going i think they got to 50 60 last i looked and i thought if doing that helps you raise money fine and you know i'm, I'm glad to do it and Yes, we can do that on online. Um, but as you said, I'm sitting here singing a couple of modern romance songs, and, and they, at one point they had like a hundred thousand people watching it. But I don't know that, and no. I can't do that. And I, I would mm -hmm. rather do 10, 15,000 people in an area where they can all, I can see them, I can see them enjoying themselves, I can sing That's to good. them. I can direct what I'm doing to them. I can get them to join in and go say, you sing this bit, I'll sing that bit. But singing and, they, and having 100,000 people watching it and being blissfully unaware because I'm just singing to a, a monitor, a screen right now, you know. Yeah. All right, there could be 20 million people watching this or two. Yeah. I don't know. So, and it's the same with when you're doing the, the gig. And um, no, you need that You need that bouncing back from the you audience. Do. 100%, 100%. That, you know, that, that feeding back and getting yeah. getting that energy from them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you mentioned someone earlier. Now, there's a talented singer I've been told about. I won't tell to them who told me about her. Her name's Natalie Grace. Can you tell us about her? Right. She is a little squirt. <laughs> She's lovely. Right, basically, um, many years ago, in actual fact, when she was 15, I heard her singing in the house. I, I, well, I say I heard her. I used to hear her singing in the house all the time because she is my daughter. Yeah. I used to hear her singing, and she sang and sang, and she was great. And, and then one day, you know when, when you have that eureka moment? And I thought, mm -hmm. although she's only 15, I thought, what an idiot. I'm paying backing singers to come and do the backing for me. Why am I not paying my daughter to do it? Hmm. She gets some money and she gets some experience and exposure because I know how much she loves singing. Um, the only time she'd been on stage with me before that, which was totally different, she was nine years old and she got on stage. And I've actually found the pictures of her a few weeks ago and I thought, I've got, I'm going to post them on Facebook. Brilliant. I mean, it, because it is sweet, it's really cute. It's, it, it's not a case of this embarrass her. She'll probably think it's cute herself. She came. I, I, I used to do a cover of um, "I Won't Let the Sun Go Down on Me" the commercial. Um, so I got her out there to do the little keyboard bit, the little da 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 that bit. So she was playing piano at the time, um, you know, getting lessons and stuff, and. Uh, I don't know how we got to it. And I said, do you want to come and do that on stage with me? That bit. She goes, yeah, all right then, you know. And then there she is on stage, nine years old. The keyboard's like up to here. She's like two little eyes yeah. peering over the top, almost. And she's playing this bit of this gig and everyone bananas. But that was the only time she ever got up on stage with me as a little piano player. Piano player. And then all these years later, um, it kind of clicked. And I thought, 
why, why am I not getting her to sing? I mean, mm. thing is, I'm, I'm proud enough of the band and the brand to say that yeah. if she couldn't sing well enough, she wouldn't be in the band. She's not in yeah. there because she's my daughter. She's in there because she can sing. And I thought, why the hell am I not getting my daughter to do it if she can sing? Um, my son, for example, plays drums. Okay. But, he's not, but he's not good enough to be in the band. But that's got a lot to do with the fact that he's not interested in doing it as a job. He does it as a hobby. Gotcha. And, yeah. and the reason he's not good enough is because he does it as a hobby and he doesn't practice enough. I'm sure if he practiced, he'd get he'd there. Be all the yeah. Because he's, a, he's not a bad little drummer. He just uh, needs a bit of discipline with his timing and stuff sometimes. Um, because he'd have to, he'd be drumming without, he drums to records. So he yeah. drums on records. He wouldn't have the record. He would be the timekeeper, not the record. Yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure that if he practiced enough, he'd be good enough. But, excuse me, he's not interested in doing it as a, uh, you know, he wants to keep it as a hobby because he loves music. He absolutely adores music, but he wants to keep it as a hobby. And I would never, there are a lot of parents are quite pushy. Oh, no, you've yeah. got to do it. I'm not like that. I've always left them to do what they want to do, what makes them happy, what gives them pleasure. That's, for me, that's the most important thing. And he does the music, uh, as I said, as a hobby. And I don't want to ruin that for him by saying, you know, putting any kind of pressure. So, no, you have to do it. He doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have to be the drummer of Modern Romance. No. Uh, first and foremost, he's my son. First and foremost, Nats is my daughter. The fact that she can sing really well, <coughs> a little cow, better than me, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but the fact that she can sing, um, I thought, well, I have to utilize that and, and encourage her as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so at 15, I got her to come and do a gig with us at the Lou Festival. Um, and I'll never forget that saying to her, yeah, come and do And the first time I said to her, do you fancy coming and doing a gig with a band and singing? I said, do, you know, do some backing vocals and do, do a couple of songs, you know, solo, do solo spots by yourself. And she went, yeah, all right then, you know. I think, and uh, part of me thinks that because she's been to quite a few gigs, she was a little bit blase about it because of that. But also because she's young and quite innocent, she hadn't realised the enormity of what she was going to have to do, which right. is good because it meant she wasn't unlike me when I said earlier I, when I first became a singer I was nervous as hell. Mm. She wasn't nervous at all. In actual fact, I asked her and said, um, "You know, before we did the gig, I said, are you nervous?" She went, "Not really, Dad." And I thought, "What do you mean, not really? Twenty thousand people out there, not nervous." And she went. Um, no, she said, um, I look at it this way. I'm going to see it. If they don't like it, don't like me for any reason. Tough luck. I'm never going to see them again. <laughs> she said, well, that's I, a great attitude. She said, I'd be Brilliant. more concerned if I was singing to people at my school because I'd have to go back to school the next day and see them because she True. was going to see them. Right? And I thought, well, that's a healthy way to look at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so, anyway, we, we did the gig. She was great. Um, I have to admit that the... the the biggest pleasure, because although we've been, we, she's been now doing it for seven years, but still, every gig we go to, although there may be 50, 100 people, 200 that were there at the last one we did, there are 22, 20,000, 18,000 people. A lot of them haven't been to a, sh a, a show that we've done. Mm. So they won't know she's my daughter. And the greatest pleasure for me is, because I don't want to influence people into liking her because she's my daughter. So I just... We do, have, we do a few songs, and then I say, um, oh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I'm going to leave you in the hands of Mrs. Natalie. She's been singing all night. They're thinking, right, you know, I'm not going to let her do a couple of solo spots, and she'll do like a Whitney Houston number because that's a sort of thing. <clears throat> and um, I let her do a couple of songs, and then I come out, and everyone's not clapping. I go, thank you very much, Natalie, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll say, um, you know, how many of your parents are here? You know, for example, I'll just say, how many of your parents are here? And the people go, yeah, and I go, so you can understand when I tell you how much pleasure it gives me to come out and say to people that this is my daughter. Wow. People just go, oh, wow, yeah, yeah. And, and it does, it always like, makes me a bit, you know, it makes my hair stand and then to think, Absolutely. my daughter's still on the stage with me, you know. And, and then having her, and a lot of times my son comes with us, so having her on stage singing and having my son down there, you know, and watching his face, when we because we do silly little things on stage, little jokes, yeah. things only us three know about, you know. 
um, is just a great feeling. Great, you know, working with one of your kids and having the other one down there watching and having all the private jokes, just Brilliant. fantastic. It's absolutely great. That's superb. Uh, we will. I will come and see her next time she does a show in London because you invited me last time, but I couldn't make it for some well, reason. Got cancelled, didn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it got cancelled. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was. I know. I was going to come. Uh, is there a book out as well? I, I was told about. Yeah, there are loads of books out, mate. Anything in particular? <laughs> what do you mean to do with me? Oh, right. Oh, you mean to do with me? Oh, right. I think it's, are there any books? Yeah. Um, right. So not, right. There's not a book out. Right, but. But I have been transcribed. This is this is news, but no one knows this. Even my friends that are watching. If any of my friends are watching, people like Fluffy. If you're watching, Sav and Katie. Uh, before you go, you got Jennifer Sabola. Sorry. You know who she is Jennifer Sabola. No. Oh, she, she's watching now. I thought she's someone we might have known. And Karen Brace and Michael Ollis. You've got a few people watching, yeah? All right. Okay. Yep. Um, this is the exclusive. If they're watching, if they're watching later on on YouTube, yep. they won't know any of this because it's happened this week. That's okay. right. Yeah. Right. But I've been transcribing the diaries from Modern Romance. Wow. I started quite a few years ago. And did like the first year. I've actually done the, the introduction and the, the preface in the first year. Um, and then I got involved in other stuff and I thought, yeah, I'll do it, you know. And I spoke to a couple of people and they said, yeah, it's interesting. You know, they looked at a few of the stories and they went, oh, yeah, this thing in the right market, in the right place, you know, pitched the right way. This could really sell because you've got some nice little stories there. Um, and I just left it. But it's something I've always wanted to do because obviously, I've, I've kept the diaries. I started the diaries before I joined Modern Romance. I used to keep a diary. Um, and I'll tell you how that came about as well. It's, it's quite funny in itself. But um, So when I joined Modern Romance, the first meeting, the first rehearsal, the first gigs are all in there. Wow. Um, and obviously any meet, any subsequent meetings with other people in our industry are all there and little bit, you know, little notes. And obviously I'll read the note and I'll go, oh, yeah, I remember that night. It all comes back, flooding back, you know, but I've got the actual date and the time and um so i've had these diaries for ages and i've been toying with them and uh, transcribing them just trying to get the bullet points yeah on screen you know so i can have them and then expand on them because obviously once it, it, it's like it's funny because the diaries it works a little bit like a song you know like you hear a song and it reminds you of a thousand things yeah and the other thing that does it as well you smell things sometimes and you remember yeah. you smell food and you remember this and that you know um, the diary's working like that, and that I look at the thing and I go, Oh, yeah, I remember that day. Yeah, yeah. And then you fill in all the bits because the diary's just got the general point of, Yeah, I went there, you know. It triggers the memory for what's gone on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, anyway, so I've been trying to get the bullet points up on on, on the laptop sort of thing. And um, then I spoke to someone yesterday who I met, met up with last year, the be beginning of 2019. So we're talking now almost uh, like a year and a half, going on for two years later. He sent me a message as well, can you get in touch with me? And um, he now, he's now got somebody who's interested in the book. Excellent. So he said, you need to finish it, because I've only done the first year. So it means after now, whereas I should have been doing it slow, I should have had it finished and done there and been expanding on it. Mm. I'm still doing the bullet points bit, but anyway. Uh, um, somebody's interested in publishing a book based on those diaries because of some of the stories that are in there. And, you know, um, I was very honest in my diary. It was my diary at the end of the day. No one else was going to see it. So I would write very honestly, very frankly, what had happened, even if it was just a, a short paragraph, it would be, did, did it wouldn't be went to Robert's had dinner with so and so and it was really nice it would be went to robert's he 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 cooked lamb it was flipping horrible yeah and we, later on we went out to do whatever he wants so it was you know lamb was a bit of a waste of time but we went out so it was very blunt and to the point and from that aspect um i kind of look at it and i think well i suppose it does make good reading because it's honest yeah there's no, there's no, there are no airs and graces no you know going around the bush it's direct Mm. And he liked it. He liked the directness of it. He said, right, I've got someone. So he only, only spoke to him yesterday because I've got someone who wants it. So you have to get on with it and finish it now. So that's a very new thing in that it's a very, very new, new sort of first one I'm telling because I haven't even told my kids. I haven't told. Brilliant. Nice. World exclusive. World exclusive for integrity. Well, there you go. Right. 
And let me ask you some more questions then, because um, we've, we've, we've got a few minutes to go. But between Modern Romance 1 and Modern Romance 2, who, well, who, on the two, who have you worked with, either between them groups or at the same time? Right. Between the two groups, I was doing like session playing. I was, right. doing, I was working in cabaret bands, doing, you know, big band, not big band, like weddings and stuff. I was a drummer, so wherever I went. Yeah. Um, so I w did some stuff with Craig McLaughlin. Remember Craig McLaughlin? Yeah, yeah, from Neighbours or something, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he, did, he had a hit with Mona, and then he had another one with almost, almost saw you crying or something, whatever it was. Anyway, I played on those and did, did the TV work with him. Uh, I did um, stuff on the Boy George album. I did some stuff for – you've got to remember, <clears throat> every nationality has their – you know, the, the Americans had Frank Sinatra, yeah. you know, you had your, your Matt Monroe's, whatever, but every nationality has got their versions yeah. in their language. So, of course, these people would come from, to England from, from Greece and Cyprus, and they'd say, we want a band, you want a drummer to play for this bloke. So I got to do all those gigs. So I'm playing with all these oh, wow. Cypriot and Greek equivalents of, you know, these, you know, mm. crooners and stuff, the Greek crooners and the Greek, you know, big stars. So I got to do quite a bit of that, which was, I was quite fortunate to do. Um, did session work with unknown bands did weddings did all kinds of stuff you know um yeah so I, that's how i passed my time away and, and made money and did quite did quite well actually it's quite lucrative so i was quite fortunate really? yeah and also I've, I, I can see behind you there's um is that arsenal behind you on the wall it, it, yeah you it can. is because well, you're a huge of Dennis Burkhan. Oh, one of my favorite players I'm not an Arsenal fan, but he was one of my favourite players. He was brilliant. Yeah, um, I've met quite a lot of the Arsenal team working with, working at Spurs, etc., and with Miles and then. Uh, quick question then: You're a football fan. Uh, are you ever thought about releasing a football song? I've done a few. You've done a few, right? Okay. I was at Barnet Football Club one day because my cousin is the chairman of Barnet. And they used to play a friendly with Arsenal every season. So they did for about six, seven seasons. And I was there one particular year, and Arsene Wenger was there, and a few of the chaps. And then I was sitting with David Dean. And I was having a chat, and I said to him, do you know what? I said, since the 70s, when Arsenal won the double and they had good old Arsenal, I said, I can't remember a song that was specifically written for the Arsenal team, no. you know, that did well, and, you know, and I can't remember anyone doing one. He said, well, write one then. So I went, okay, leave that with me. So um, I then went away and changed the words. It was at the time, it was it was um, when Arsenal had the Invincibles that year. Yeah. Um, and I changed the lyrics to Best Years of Our Lives, and I changed it to Best Team in the Land. Oh, wow. And I changed all the lyrics, and it was about Henri and Vieira and everyone else yeah. with that whole team, you know, what a team. Anyway. Um, so I sent it to David Dean and he loved it. So he put it forward into, you know, to the powers that be in, and, and, um, he said, we'll probably take that as a, and, and endorse that as an Arsenal song and blah, blah, blah. I'm oh, marvelous, you know? So anyway, I went to a game. And the next game I went to, I'm, I went with some, you know, we were seated to the oldest, so I'm chatting to some friends, I'm chatting away, and, you know, as I'm chatting, I kind of like stopped and I thought, <coughs> What's going on? It's on the Tannoy. No. <laughs> yeah. This is the, the Emirate. This is the uh, Highbury. Oh, oh, the old Highbury. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I thought, what the hell? And he's playing. Uh, you know, and so we're, you know, the chorus is, whoa, 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 give them all a hand. Whoa, whoa, whoa best team in the land. Ba, 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 da, ba, ba, you know. Um, and I got a phone call the next day from like one of the PR people saying, did you hear your song? And I went, yeah, you know. <laughs> And yes, I did. You know, they went, Oh, yeah, all the players were dancing to it in the tunnel. <laughs> oh, mate, this is it. Anyway, before you could even say anything about anything, David Dean was gone. Yeah. And within so, like, the whole project, because obviously it was yeah. all with him. And that was yeah. in the end of So, what I did after that is I changed the lyrics to I, 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 and I did it for Barnet Football Club. And they got promoted the year that I did that as well. They got promoted to the next division. And um, and then many, many years later, about 
yeah, quite a few years later, I did it for them. I did best years of our lives because Tony was always moaning. The, the chairman was always saying, you know, you did, oh, you did it for Arsenal. You know, we always wanted best years, and it's great. And uh, uh, so, without telling him one day, uh, years later, I just went in one day and said, "Hello, oh, right. I said, I've got something for you." And I gave him a CD. He goes, "What's that?" I said, "Play it." And he went, "You've done it, haven't you?" And I went, well, "Yeah." <laughs> Anyway, I did best team in the land for Barney. But then recently what happened was, and this is this is going to be out soon, this week, hopefully. I've All seen right. the I've seen the draft of it today. I was talking to my good mate Fluffy, who is a Spurs fan. You know, they called themselves the Yid Army. Yeah. I was talking to him, right? No, actually, we were texting, um, as you always do. We've, we've always got banter. Love him to death. And mm. The day that Arsenal play Spurs, we go, oh, I'm going you know, to hate you for today. Yeah, you know. But, you know um, and we're always very, very, you know, if Spurs get a penalty that shouldn't have been a penalty, he'll tell me that was never a penalty. We're very honest about it, even though we don't care because, well, we've got a penalty against you. I don't care how yeah, we score. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we have bound tennis, all great. Anyway, so we're having this chat one day online, and uh, he's always said to me, you know, you lot were South London club. You're like a bunch of gypsies. You just up and go <laughs> to stuff to North London, part yeah. of caravans there, you know. So anyway, so this particular day, it's only a few weeks ago, he said, oh, well, line, he goes to me, no, you're still a bunch of pikeys anyway. So I texted back and I went, I'd rather be a pikey than a yid, mate. <laughs> and it was just, and then I thought, that's a really good title for a song. So anyway, I have rewritten the lyrics to one of our hits. Right. Put it, I gave it to somebody and I said, right, Put some images to it because I want to send it as a WhatsApp to some friends. Um, and I know that one of the first people to get it will be Emil Heskey and Ian Wright because Fluffy knows them. Gotcha. So he'll send it to them. They'll think it's hilarious because it's all banter. It's all a laugh, you know. Yeah. There's a bit of swearing in it. But having said that, it's a football song. It's not a, football, yeah. it's not a song for the ball. No. So um, I've done that. And I saw the draft of it today with, with the pictures and everything, you know, with the images because I sent him loads of images. But some of them were a bit blurry, so I'm gonna to have to pick new images and say to guy, the guy, the person that's doing it, look, do me a favor, get rid of the scruffy images. Because some of them are really crystal clear, and then you get this blurry image, and I thought, no, you can't have that. I know it's only on WhatsApp, but you want it to be you want it to be nice. Look good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, so hopefully I'll he'll get that done tomorrow if I ask him if I could send him an email tonight and say, look, those pictures are nice, but you know these ones get rid of and put the i'm going to do the research tonight find pictures that are nice and um hopefully yeah that'd be the way and it'd be nice because it's promoting the band yeah because it's i mean listen fluffy played it to his kids his kids are like you know early 20s and you know um even they as spurs fans they've been born and raised spurs fans by their dad were sitting there going like that listening to it and say dad you can't help it but move your head to it even though it's slagging off our team yeah Oh, that's um, good. Is that going to be on YouTube as well? You're going to put it on YouTube? Well, I'm going to stick it. I'm going to stick it everywhere. Stick it on yeah, YouTube. Right. What's happening to people? And then just leave it as banter. And listen, I, I actually did a little disclaimer thing that that hopefully will be at the end of it to say to people, look, before anyone gets on their high horse, because I know how some people. Oh, they do, any, yeah. 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 Yid is nothing to do with Yiddish or Jewish. No. Anything. It's what the Spurs fans call themselves. You say, "What are you?" And they go, "I'm a Yid." Like we say, yeah. "I'm a Jew." They see the Yid army. No, they, they do. They see the Yid army. They're practicing Yid army. So, if anyone, make, if anyone wants to make anything of it race-wise, bring yeah. it on. But, you know, you'll look a bit stupid because there are fifty thousand Spurs fans that proudly yeah. sing it every week and would yeah. not have it any other way. And Absolutely. it's banter at the end of the day. Yeah, it's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm going to mention this tomorrow when I go to um, Moon Dance Records in where I live because George, who works there, is a huge Arsenal fan. Right. So for that, and his brother that works here as well is a Spurs fan. But George is a George is a great great Arsenal. How did that fan. happen? Two brothers. I know. Yeah. George and Eddie. George is Arsenal and Eddie's Spurs. But there you go. They're lovely people. Moon Dance. Just to let you know, this Jennifer Sabola is someone I know, which is a singer called Dust Sweetness, and I met her at the Brit Awards. And she says, "Oh, she you know her, hey, yeah, you've done well." She said, and also it looks like she's a she's a gunner as well. She's put love it gunner for life. Oh, Jennifer, I love you, Don. <laughs> Bless her. Listen, we're, we're going to wrap this up very shortly. It's been brilliant. 
Absolutely brilliant, and it's good to see you again, even though it's from on the screen. Uh, thanks for coming over to Belfast and doing the show with Elir in Belfast when I first met you. That was fabulous. That was a pleasure. That was, that was great. fantastic. Yeah, and you sat there with Richie and um, having a few drinks and a few chats, so it's quite nice. Yeah. That's yeah. lovely guy. Right, last question for you. And again, thank you very much for everything you got. Get these records out, get this book out, get this book done, get these things going, keep people happy, get the CD out because music has got to get people going in yeah, this bad absolutely. time. You know? Absolutely. As you know, we're called integrity. So what does integrity mean to you? Integrity, what is integrity? Right. Well, integrity means, listen, it's funny because I'll bring Fluffy into this again. Fluffy's right. probably got more integrity than anyone else I know, as as has my mate Sav. I've got like four mates, and all four of them are my friends because they have very rare qualities, and one of them is integrity. In that, their integrity for me means honesty mm -hmm. and not being able to, for example, not being able to take advantage of somebody even though you're in a position to. Yeah. Finding it distasteful to do that because you know it's not right. Yeah. And very few people have that kind of integrity. And I'll give you an example. Um, I don't like to air my dirty laundry because it's not anyone's business. But, for example, I had a guitarist that I was working with who I got rid of a couple of years ago. But we did some songs. The, the songs on the album, um, three of them, I co-wrote with him. Right. Now, despite the fact that we're not speaking to each other um, and we've got nothing in writing... My in own personal integrity would not be me. Obviously, I've got to recoup what the album cost me first. But from that point, my integrity would not allow me to get money and go, well, he'll never know I got this, so I no. can keep it all. Because you won't know what the album sold. No, I know what, what the album sold, and I know that this money is his. And my integrity would not allow me to keep that money because I would sit there and go, well, how would I feel if someone did that to me? No, yeah. it's not right. And I, I can't do it. So integrity is having that that feeling, that that knowledge that what you do affects others and therefore you have to be you have to be a gentleman. Yeah. And that's it. Integrity is having that feeling of right, that feeling of be, you know, of, of knowing that you can't do wrong to others and know about it. Yeah. Because if you can do something wrong to someone and know about it, then yeah. for me, you're not you're not the person I want to be. You're not a person I want to interact Absolutely. with or have any kind of communication with. That's great. So, well, Jennifer just said she thought it was a great interview and she's going to go and find all your music now, Andy. There you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, tell, her come and say hello to me. tell her to come and find me on Facebook and come and say hello. There you go. See, if you hear anyone, that, anyone. Hello. anyone. And so anyone and is Come and say hello. Come and find me and say hello. Brilliant. Listen, we're going to shoot off now. But listen, thank you very much for giving us your time today and your dinner time as well. My pleasure, mate. <laughs> it's listen, I'm not saying I'm hungry, but at the moment that I'm looking at you on screen, I'm not actually seeing you. I'm seeing the chickens oh, running across the screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody tuned in and commented. Thank you very much. Listen, all take care. Look after yourself and stay safe. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. See you later.